When you play the Game of Thrones, you subscribe and like. Or you die. There is no middle ground. All right, hello YouTube. Welcome back to the Reese Common YouTube channel. Today's video, we are going to be talking about Robert's Rebellion. We're going to be continuing on on our series, and this time we're going to be going back to Robert Baratheon, his campaign in the South. And this time, it's going to be much different. Whereas the last time we were with Robert, it was about really uniting the Stormlands. Now it's about taking that army and reuniting it, right? Because right now, how we've talked about in all of these parts is how we have these sec separate sections of the country that are at war. So, for instance, we have the Vale, we have the North, we have the Stormlands. How are they going to unite, right? Because right now, they're all three different armies that could be dealt with in time if you're the Targaryens. So, How do you combine to create one massive army? And so, Robert has the most difficult task. He has to come up from the south, basically crossing through the Crownlands and getting to the Riverlands. How is he going to do that without being captured and or killed? And so that's the biggest part of this. And so like we talked about in the last episode with Ned coming down south, rallying the north, we're going to have a bunch of different factions trying to meet up at this time. And so I want to kind of point this out because, you know, as I was doing my research for the video in the Battle of the Bells section that we see in the Wiki of Ice and Fire, they actually have a note that Ned managed to reach Winterfell to call his banners. I don't know if that's actually confirmed. I don't remember Ned ever confirming that in the first book or where that information was confirmed at. Um, given the fact that uh, in the World of Ice and Fire book, that is not mentioned. It is just mentioned that Ned rallied his banners. We're not sure where he actually called his banners at. And so there have been kind of conflicting reports. I don't know if that's actually been set in stone that he made it to Winterfell or he was like at White Harbor, like how Order of the Greenhand thinks. So, again, it's not a big detail, in my opinion, but it is something I wanted to point out just in case I was wrong in the last video, but let me know what you guys think on that. And so, at this time, we see Ned and John Aaron meeting up once again with both of their armies. And at this point, right, they have to negotiate, okay, how do we get through the Riverlands? Are the Riverlands going to oppose us, or are they not going to oppose us? And I think it's very obvious. I think they knew that they could create an alliance with Hoster Tully once again. Brandon Stark was said to marry Catelyn, and so there was already that interest of having a Northern and Riverland alliance, and then you also add on Jon Arryn as well. And so they ended up negotiating for his support. Now, the weddings would not happen at this time, as there were still more pressing matters for now, but that'll get us back to the Robert Baratheon timeline, and we'll continue forward with his story. But before we do, if you guys like to like, subscribe, and comment, please do it helps the channel grow. Read your appeal up my like this content as well. And also, if you do want to become a member or a Patreon, you do get videos early and also just supports me. So thank you for the people that do that. And let's continue on with Robert and his rebellion. So before we can get to the Battle of the Bells, we have to talk about the Battle of Ashford. Now, the Battle of Ashford is a battle that occurs before we get to the Battle of the Bells. It's one of those that I think is very much forgotten because... What we end up seeing is Robert needs to basically get north, but he can't just go straight north from Summerhall. That would take him too close to King's Landing. And so the way you're going to want to do it is you're going to want to go west to then go north. And the other part of that is the Riverlands and or River Run where they want to meet up is a bit further to the west anyway. So it actually makes sense to go west now to then go north. And so that's what we end up seeing occur. But as Robert marched out, he leaves his younger brother Stannis to be in charge of Storm's End. And at Ashford, Lord Raynal Tarly fell upon Robert's forces. But what I find is very fascinating about this battle is we see that there's a lot of indecision with the, the Reach, right? They don't really feel like they're fully in the battle. We see that Randall Tarly is the first to meet Robert Baratheon on his march west. And he actually defeats Robert for the most part. He defeats Robert's vanguard, weakens him a ton, and by the time the Mace Tyrell gets there, which is a bit after this, Robert's all been pushed back. Now, we know that Robert's going to escape this, but this battle is seen as being indecisive by the Maesters and by history, and I don't know how that could be the case. Given that Randall Tarly makes Robert run away from the battle and flee, this is clearly a victory for, Robert, or for Randall Tarly. And so I look at this battle and I go, huh, interesting. This is definitely one of those scenarios where the victor writes history, where we discount that this was more like an indecisive battle when in true, in reality, 
It really wasn't. It was more like a complete victory for Randall Tarley. And it also cements Randall Tarley as being a fairly good general. But it also says one other thing. It shows Mace Tyrell's incompetence. Now, something I would be interested in is, did Mace Tyrell stay back on purpose? Did he pull a Walder Frey? Did he let Randall Tarley take the heat of this battle? And if Randall Tarley ended up losing it, or something of that nature... Then he could say, oh, you know, Randall Tarly, he was the fault for why Robert got away. Or if Randall won, he could take the credit like he ends up doing. You know, you see both of those. So we end up seeing basically Mace Tyrell take all the credit. Another slight to Randall Tarly, which is another reason as to why I believe Randall Tarly will end up betraying the Tyrells and going to probably Young Griff in the next book. But this is just one of those many things. But after we see this, after Robert is able to flee and head north um, to the Stony Sept, we see that Mace Tyrell doesn't follow him, which doesn't make any sense either. Mace Tyrell instead decides to go east. He goes to Storm's End to siege it, which makes no sense. Robert Baratheon has all the forces of the Stormlands with him. If you kill Robert Baratheon, the rebellion is all but over right now. And so it is very jarring to me to think about Mace Tyrell as he makes another blunder. Because if you think about what ends up happening, we see John Connington's forces again trying to harass Robert Baratheon and trying to catch up to him. If you have both Mace Tyrell's forces and Connington's loyalist forces at the Stony Sept, the war probably goes very differently. Again, just another blunder of bad military leadership that we see from the loyalist side of things. But also things to think about during the battle, we see Lord Catherine was cut down by Randall Tarley, again, one of the lords that switched to Robert's side after losing in a battle. And we also see that Randall Tarley sends his head to King Eris, something that would have greatly pleased him. But something else I find very interesting is not only does Robert escape, but he also is able to escape with the bulk of his forces to join his forces later on with Ned and John Aaron. That is also remarkable, that not only was this a battle in which Robert seems to lose, but he still gets all of his forces away from it without losing too much. But again, we would see Mace Tyrell march on to Storm's End, laying siege to the castle for close to a year until it is relieved by Ned after the war. And this leads us directly into the events of the Battle of the Bells and Robert's journey north to the Stony Sept. And we're seeing as and seeing as Owen Merriweather is replaced by Lord Connington as the hand of the king, which I'll talk about a little bit more during the battle, the Battle of the Bell section of the video. So as Robert is coming north, trying to get together with the forces of the Northern Coalition, as like I like to call them, we see that something different happens. Now we touched on this in past videos, but Lord John Connington is made the hand of the king. Very similar to the Dance of the Dragons timeline, or even the first Blackfire Rebellion, in times of war, having a hand of the king that is more of a leader, someone that can command your forces and take the fight to the enemy can be beneficial, but it also can be not as good. As we talked about, Tywin Lannister didn't believe John, John Connington was ready, and it seems very apparent that he was right, but John Connington to fight off the or of Rob Baratheon does what should have been done a long time ago. He leads a mighty army into the field. And we're told that, again, that Robert Baratheon was on the run, right? Rob Baratheon was not trying to have a fight with John Connington. And so the, the reason I would say this is probably the case is given that I think John Connington probably had more men than Robert did at this time. Again, remember, Robert has just the Stormlands behind him. John Connington would have a big loyalist force at this time, quite comparable to, say, what we're going to see with Rhaegar. Not as big as Rhaegar's force, because Rhaegar also had some other forces there as well. But... It would be kind of similar to that situation, except Robert didn't have as many men. And so you're also looking at it from this point of view, if you're Robert, that you don't even want to take the risk of having this fight. If you can make it back to, you know, Ned and John Aaron, the war is much more on an evil, much more on an even ground. And I would even say you're probably favored to win in that situation if you are able to meet up with all these forces. And so what ends up happening is we kind of see like a guerrilla warfare type thing play out where Robert is doing this grueling march north with John Connington on his heels at all these different times. And we don't know exactly what ends up transpiring here, right? We know that eventually Robert ends up wounded and alone. We don't know how, though. Now, I would guess that 
or maybe a surprise attack by John Connington's forces or some sort of night raid and Robert has to stumble away. Um, maybe that's possible. Maybe that's what occurs. And so, but, but regardless, he ends up at Stony Sept. And so just so you guys kind of know where we're at, Stony Sept is not very far from River Run. So you can tell that River, that Robert nearly makes it to River Run. Again, it's a little bit to the south east of Heron Hall. Um, it's directly below Acorn Hall, a little bit south from Pink Maiden. So again, it's kind of borderlining on like the west and then also just right below River Run. So again, you can tell he almost made it. So what does that tell you about john connington and how slow the targaryens were right because you got to think about it he had to come all the way down from summer hall all the way up to river run and it took this long for there really to be a kind of big attack that leads robert in a very vulnerable position and so i think that's very important to understand as well as we go forward with this whole event but john conning then then took the town by force and began to search every town and this is where we come to this big decision if you're John Connington. John Connington is still a young man. He's very honorable to appear. He is not someone that's like Tywin, right? And that's made very clear in, you know, John Con's POVs and in Dance with Dragons. He is someone that tries to take the honorable approach. You know, he tries to do a number of things, threatening the people, trying to be nice to the people and trying to give them rewards, offering any information on Robert or for him to be shown. And again, John Connington's not stupid. He knows that Robert is here. It's just, how does he get him out, right? How does he get the people to stop helping him? And we've seen a very similar situation like this with Sir Arthur Dane and Jamie Lannister and a lot of the stories they told early on with like the Robert Knight story. So again, I, I think John Connington's approach is flawed because yes, something like Arthur Dane's approach could have worked here, but the issue is you didn't have the time, right? You're not that far from River Run, right? You're probably less than a day's ride from River Run. And so you have to think as soon as the rebels hear what's going on, they're going to send a huge force south. So in a lot of ways, you're forced with a really big moral conundrum. If you're John Connington, do you just burn out all these towns, destroy it until you find Robert Barath Baratheon and kill him? That is what I think in war, if you wanted to win the war quickly, should have been done. But that's not what John Connington ends up doing. As we learn, the residents of the town were actively helping Robert. However, and despite the search, the offered pardons and rewards, the threats, and the hostages Connington took and hung in crow cages, they could not find Robert. Again, it just shows you the love that the people had for Robert Baratheon. He was someone that was a warrior. He was winning uh, every battle at this point. He was beloved by these people. And... You also have got to think, like, what was the thought process behind why they didn't like the Targaryens or why they went against the Targaryens? Targaryens at this time didn't have a great, like, reputation, right? Eris was already the Mad King at this time. Rhaegar, the rumor was that he had kidnapped and was presumably raping Lyanna Stark. It's not a good look for House Targaryen. Uh, and then you have this big guy in Robert Baratheon who is the definition of this big warrior someone you would like to hang out that's how people always describe robert in his youth and so that is a big point of the why they probably didn't even bother helping john connington this eventually leads to the rebel forces getting to stony sept and doing the battle of the bells again just takes john connington way too long but the battle begins with lord stark and tully arriving with a rebel army Again, the soldiers just fought throughout the town, on the streets, the alleys, the rooftops, and the septons rang the bells to warn the residents to lock their doors. Again, if you're just some common person here, you do not want to be involved in this. And also, when Robert Baratheon pops out, it confirms that you guys were traitors. So if John Connington is to win, he probably will put the city to the torch, or the town to the torch. So... It would make sense why they would do something like that. But this also gives the name of the battle, the Battle of the Bells, because it was an indicator, a warning to make sure the people of the town stayed indoors. But we also know that this was a tough battle. It wasn't like one of these where the rebels just routed John Connington's forces. It was a hard fought battle. And there was actually many like deaths that were interesting in this battle, important to the story. 
But let's think about John Coddington himself and why he was a pretty skilled warrior. He ends up managing to wound Hoster Tully, a veteran of wars by this point. He had killed John Aaron's cousin, Sir Dennis Aaron, and he eventually... And eventually this spurs Robert Baratheon to come out of the Peach, the brothel in which he had been hiding in. Again, it's just very on the nose that Robert Baratheon would be in a brothel given his reputation and all of those things. Again, proving Lyanna right about Robert and his nature. But Robert seems like he's able to rally the rebel forces, defeating what was left of Connington's forces, scattering them to the wind, and John Connington himself nearly dying, but he avoids capture and or being killed. And this is going to be the turning point of the war, right? This is that point where it came from the Targaryens and this whole time we're in control to not so much, right? At this time now, you have the joining of all of our forces. Rob Baratheon has a very decisive win. This is a win that I think a lot of Westeros would go, yeah, this is a serious threat. And Robert kind of has the upper hand now. He's a veteran of multiple battles now at this time. This is his and this battle would prove to be very detrimental for the Targaryens, as this would mark the beginning of the end for them. We would also see that Eris began to realize that this was a major threat. Robert Baratheon was, in a lot of ways, the biggest threat since the Dance of the Dragons or the first Blackfyre Rebellion with Daemon I. And so he ends up saying, John Connington, you're not the hand of the king anymore. He was suspicious of the failure and sent John Connington into exile. At this time, Lord Carlton Ches Chelsted was the new hand of the king in Connington's stead. Also, the King's Guard then are sent out to rally Connington's men. Again, they are kind of spread to the wind after the defeat to kind of rally them up, as well as trying to build up new levies within the Crownlands and new men to rally a new army. And lastly, we see that Gerald, or Gerald Hightower was sent by King Eris to find Rhaegar Targaryen. The fact that Rhaegar had not been a part of this war for this long into it, right, by the time it was already equalized, that is when Rhaegar is finally sent to lead the Loyalist army. It's quite confusing. Why wasn't he here already? And we've talked about this over and over and over again. It seems like he valued more his potential child he was having with Lyanna more than the entire war effort that was going to overthrow his family. Now, was it because he was cocksure that the Targaryens would sit the throne because that's how the prophecy goes? Maybe. We just don't know. Something else that's interesting is to show that we know that Gerald Hightower knew where Rhaegar Targaryen was, or at least he found information to find out where Rhaegar was because nobody knew where he really was. That's what we're led to believe. And so how did he figure this out? That's something else we have to question. Did Varys know this information? Or did Hightower already know? I tend to believe that Hightower already knew, but this could be information that he passed on to someone else in turn. And that could be something that helps Ned figure out where Lyanna is later on. But we also see some other precautions happen. Rhaegar comes back and instantly tries to convince Eris to ask Tywin for help. This is, why wasn't this done already? Again, we know it's pride. We know it's because Eris wasn't taking the threat seriously, but it shows that Rhaegar is at least smart enough to realize the war is not going well for them right now. It's not like they're going to lose. It's still 50-50 at this time, but it's going more and more in favor of the rebels. And you don't want to take that risk, right? If you get Tywin on your side, let's say it goes down to 75-25 for the loyalists, that's way better than 50-50. But at this time, we also see Eris begin his measures if they lose. He starts getting his alchemist to place caches of wildfire on multiple locations in King's Landing, all of which are basically a failsafe. If they lose, King's Landing goes with them. He doesn't want anybody to basically come after him. That's more or less what his thought process is. But with both Elbert Aaron and Dennis Aaron now dead, John Aaron was in need of an heir. And this is going to create an opening. So like we talked about with those um, trying to get like we talked about with trying to get the support of Hoster Tully and the Riverlands, this now creates an opportunity that Hoster Tully swiftly puts to end. He gets his daughter Lysa to be married to John and Ned to take up the marriage of his brother with Catelyn. And this is a really big marriage for the Riverlands, right? They gain a lot here, right? They gain two of the largest houses marrying into them, but they also gain protection from both the East and the North. It's a nice alliance that actually allows the Riverlands to focus on a lot of their western and southern defenses 
because of the alliances that they've created. And this is a really savvy move from Hoster Tully, albeit it's not, you know, the nicest thing in the world to marry your daughter to some older guy that, you know, it's not a great match for someone like Lysa, if you think about it, in terms of what she would actually want in a partner. But that is what ends up happening. And so that is going to be the end of the video. We're going to talk about the Battle of the Trident in its own video because I don't really feel like putting it into this video as well. It would just be too long, and I want these episodes to be kind of a certain length. But yeah, thank you guys all for watching, and I'll see you guys all in the next video. I'm really excited to do the Battle of the Trident, and bye, guys.